In this presentation, I share some preliminary results of an interview study designed to explore the material, technical, rhetorical, and emotional dimensions of baking and cooking. I'll be focusing specifically on some of the ways participants described using food to achieve various goals and purposes, to inform, instruct, memorialize, motivate, ritualize, and or as a form of self-care. By foregrounding the embodied, multisensory, and complexly distributed aspects of the interviewee's cooking and baking practices, the presentation also works, implicitly so, to caution against the still too common conflation of multimodality with digital or new media texts and practices. In keeping with the editors of Beyond the Archives, Research as a Lived Process, I believe that how a researcher chooses a subject, or perhaps we might say how it finds her, is a subject unto itself. And I share their concerns about the degree to which the connections woven through our scholarly and personal lives either remain largely unarticulated or risk being marginalized because they appear to be merely intuitive, coincidental, or serendipitous. Cognizant as well that the paths to and between research projects are rarely clear-cut and straightforward, but, as Lucille Schultz maintains, marked by twists and turns with detours and side trips, I wanted to begin by saying a little bit about how and why I came to this project. Years before I'd begin working and learning here at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, or here, University of Illinois, where I did my graduate work, or here, Loyola University in Chicago, where I was an undergrad, or even here, taking classes at the local community college, I spent 13 years working and learning here, a Mexican restaurant in Rolling Meadows, Illinois. This was my food home, my memory home, and a place where I lived, where I embodied, where I practiced daily many of the concepts, theories, and ideas I'd go on to learn names for and read more about in grad school. Composition, rhetoric, kairos, remediation, multimodality, metacommunicative awareness, and where the available means of persuasion were never limited, in fact could not be limited, to what might be achieved through talk or text, but included the meaning potentials of objects, images, smells, sounds, tastes, thermostat settings, gestures, textures, facial expressions, and the position and performance of bodies, whether sitting still, animated, agitated, and or simply moving through space. This was a place, one quite unlike most of my experiences in academia, where alphabetic literacy, writing, talk, and text, mediated interactions to be sure but was never the whole or even really the point of those interactions, and where one's success depended largely on one's ability to anticipate, align with, and flexibly respond to or navigate the demands of a dynamic, ever-changing, multisensory, multimodal, and, of course, food-based environment. About 10 years into my waitressing career, I began attending classes at a local community college simply because I wanted to learn things. What began largely as a hobby increasingly became a way of life and later a profession. When one of my professors indicated that I was a good writer and that I could become an even better writer if I read more and if I practiced my writing more. And so writing it was, or mostly writing, as I understand better now how the restaurant years quite likely shaped my pedagogical approach, my interest in multimodality, and the creation of complex multi-part rhetorical events where meaning is conveyed through text and talk, as well as through objects, images, sounds, movement, texture, taste, and even scent. Flash forward to December 2016. While browsing through a resale shop, I came across an old edition of the Settlement Cookbook. Randomly opening to a page in the text with a recipe for peanut butter cupcakes, I reasoned the text was worth the 50 cents they were asking for it. 
Within a week or two of making this purchase, my father suddenly died, and my response, somewhat inexplicably, was to put the cookbook to use and to begin teaching myself how to bake. And so I baked. I mean, I baked a lot. Even and most especially when I knew I should be reading or writing instead. But the desire to collect and peruse old cookbooks, the desire to measure, mix, fold, beat, touch, taste, smell, test, and decorate was too strong. Baking for me, at least at that time, had become what writing had so long been for me, both a comfort and obsession, a way of coming to and becoming through, a way of knowing, understanding, thinking, being, and at times grieving. Eager to find a way to justify this newest hobby, I decided to return to a variation of a project I'd briefly considered pursuing some 20 years ago while a literature student in grad school, examining cookbooks as a form of women's narrative. This time, however, I was particularly interested in the way cookbooks published between 1930 and 1979 sought to impress upon readers the rhetorical potential of food, teaching readers, in essence, how to become flexible, savvy, material rhetoricians in their own right, using baking and cooking as a way not only to persuade and influence others, but as a way of informing, introducing, instructing, motivating, memorializing, connecting, and dividing. I was interested as well in how the cookbooks often underscored for readers the creative, playful, experimental, and artistic dimensions of baking and cooking. Mindful, however, that popular and prescriptive texts, such as cookbooks, don't often represent what actual readers, configured narrowly here, as white, middle-to-upper-class women, and in some instances men, actually did in the kitchen, or how they felt about their work in the kitchen, I began, in the spring of 2019, to conduct an IRB-approved interview study focused on people's histories, memories, and experiences of baking and cooking as a way of better understanding the complex, highly distributed, material, effective, performative, embodied, and lived dimensions of what I've termed unedible rhetoric. In Recipes for Theory Making, food philosopher Lisa Helke maintains that there is no one reason why people experiment in the kitchen, suggesting that those who cook might be motivated to do so for all sorts of reasons, to enter contests, to use up leftovers, to experiment with tastes, to secure their jobs, or to play. And it's not always the case that time spent in the kitchen is necessarily or only motivated by the goal of producing food. Rather, as Helke notes, sometimes food is an accidental byproduct, second in importance to some other aim. Thus far, 115 people have participated in this study, and what I'll be focusing on today are some of the ways participants describe the various purposes that cooking or baking serves specifically so, what it allows them to do and who it allows them to be. When asked to name some of the purposes cooking or baking serves for them, participants often spoke of how it allows them to express love and care, to nourish their own and other bodies, and to exercise control over routine, budget, and dietary concerns. Still others, even those who deeply enjoy time spent cooking and baking, admitted that there are times when they do so simply because they have to. Or as one participant put it, we all gotta eat. In her interview, Annie, age 32, drew an important distinction between eating and having a meal, or food as nutrition versus food as a performative act of creating something beautiful and nourishing as a gift to someone else, explaining that eating is just a thing she does when she's hungry, while making a meal, by contrast, is an intentional experience that she typically, almost exclusively, shares with other people. For still others, baking and cooking figure as a salient aspect of their identity. It's part of who they are, it's what they do, what they're known for, and in this way is often also a source of power and pride. Maxie, age 20, described how it makes her feel confident, 
less afraid of failure. I'm generally a good student, but I always have in the back of my mind a potential for failure or getting a bad grade. With cooking, I'm free to try new things because I know it's going to be okay and that people are going to eat it. Erica, age 37, described how challenging herself to make something new is a source of empowerment that makes her feel like she can do anything. For Carolyn, age 53, fancier cooking represents a way to shine, to impress people, adding that she especially enjoys the challenge of taking other people's flavor requests and turning them into something different from what they might have expected. Others detailed how baking and cooking, what one participant described as a form of oral storytelling, provides opportunities for community, connection, and conversation, functioning almost as a talking point or icebreaker of sorts, a way of bringing people together, sharing examples of how they communicate about, through, and even with the food itself. Likening cooking for others as a way of bonding without having to speak, Maxie views food as a language that most people speak, reasoning that even people who say they're not interested in baking or cooking are at least interested in eating. Allowing that some people can be more fluent in food than others, she believes that everybody has their own sort of food language that another can learn. That is to say, in learning their preferences, you learn to speak their language so you can give them something they will enjoy. Others underscored how kitchen talk provides a way of establishing common ground, making potentially awkward conversations or encounters a little less so. Maintaining that food is a great topic to talk with somebody about, especially if you don't know them very well or if you're nervous about meeting them, Jenny, age 46, recalls forging a connection with her future mother-in-law by asking her to share a recipe for something she made for her son, now Jenny's husband, while he was growing up. Anna, explaining that she's had a kind of distant relationship with one of her sisters, also a dedicated cook, allowed that their shared interests became kind of like an inroads for the two of them to reconnect. Similarly, while Maxie admitted that she and her mother don't talk that often and aren't super duper close, one constant connection has been that her mother has always liked Maxie's interest in cooking. I know that I can call her anytime asking something like, what's in this recipe, and she'll be really happy to tell me. Still others talked about the communicative aspects of baking and cooking in a more effective autobiographical way. Medea, age 32, spoke about energy in relation to making. Whether I'm writing something composing poetry or painting or cooking, my energy gets translated or transferred into my product. So when I'm in a good mood, my food turns out. At other times, her kids might remark that a dish is a little too salty. Kirsten, age 30, said her dishes also greatly reflect her mood, and her friends often joke that they never eat the same recipe twice. Depending on my mood, I might throw ginger or lemon into a recipe, and if I'm really melancholy, I don't want as strong of flavors, or if I'm feeling really excited, I'm more likely to add in a kick of spice to elevate the flavor in some way. Chloe, age 37, also spoke of having off cooking days, underscoring the importance of being present in the kitchen. When I'm having an off day, my cooking doesn't come out at all. It starts with a feeling. I already know it's not going to come out. Maybe I'm stressed about work or there's something in the back of my mind that's bothering me so I can't fully pay attention to what I'm doing. And here, Chloe touches on another aspect of culinary communication, the way one attends to and communicates with the food itself. Reflecting on her attempts to teach her husband to cook, she said, the thing I can't quite explain to him is that you need to pay attention. You won't know what's happening if you're not paying attention. You just need to be there, checking, looking, listening. You have to pay attention. Still others spoke of the meditative, therapeutic aspects of baking and cooking. Chloe says she cooks or bakes whenever she needs to center herself. Erica engages in kitchen therapy when she needs to work through stress or challenges, while Lisa, age 50, says cooking often allows her to achieve a kind of flow experience, one that warps time in a good way. Jenny talked about 
using cooking as a means to distress from work, adding that dishes that involve a lot of chopping or prep work that some folks might avoid is actually very calming for her. The rest of your life, she said, might be going down the toilet or you might hate what's happening with people at work, but you can do something in your kitchen that you have a little more control over. Even if it ends up tasting terrible, you still get that pleasure of creating something on your own. For Gina, age 33, cooking allows her peaceful alone time. I can go in the kitchen, and even if there are people around, I feel like I'm by myself. The kitchen is my little retreat, my hideaway. Even though it's in the middle of the house, it's personal. Annie says she especially appreciates the physicality of cooking, what she calls haptic meditation. Misha, age 34, also spoke of the physical aspects of cooking, appreciating that it allows her to do something with her hands, to create something that wasn't there before, something that you can touch. I think what makes it therapeutic, she said, is that it activates different parts of my brain than I use when I'm reading or writing. Academic work, reading and writing in particular, were often mentioned in relation to or as a point of contrast to cooking. As Joan, age 69, related, I cook to calm myself down and get lost in a project that has a definite outcome, so unlike academe. Piro Prisha credits cooking with providing her a safe space where she feels like she has full control, unlike her academic space where she says she feels like an imposter. Kirsten also used baking as a way to distress. I find that learning complicated things to bake takes me out of my usual headspace and gives me something challenging to do that's different from her grad work, noting that even when attempting a difficult bake, she can usually overcome what she's doing wrong in a recipe and get a product that she can look at and be, yes, I'm victorious. She appreciates as well how cooking or baking allows her to overcome challenges in a really tangible way. That's not something I get from the stress of my profession because there's a lot of invisible labor involved, particularly with the nature of my dissertation. She goes on to note that even if she overcomes challenges associated with her academic work, it's not something that she can easily share with others. I can post pictures of my pretty macarons on social media sharing with others how hard I've worked. And people are more able to process that achievement than, say, if I post a page of writing that I've revised. They don't always know how to process that. Participants also spoke of the pedagogical aspects of baking and cooking, underscoring how, even for the most experienced baker or cook, there is always more to learn, to discover, to try. As Kirsten stated, every time I screw up, I learn something different. Or as Jenny suggests, both cooking and baking offer levels of complexity that meet you wherever you're at. Erica, describing baking and cooking as her creative outlet, prides herself on maintaining her curiosity over the years and continuing to try new dishes and techniques. I love breaking things down, trying new spices, and figuring out complementary flavor combinations. Like Erica, Amanda, in her early 30s, enjoys the creative aspects of cooking. I keep a pretty well-stocked pantry, so it's always fun to look at the ingredients I have on hand and think about what I can make. Kathy, age 55, also enjoys working with new recipes and ingredients, admitting that she rarely makes recipes more than once, in part because while growing up, we had the same things constantly. Beyond affording opportunities for learning and experimentation, cooking provides still other opportunities for teaching. As Maxie put it, Cooking can be a way of showing people things that they didn't know through food. Whether this involves the history of the food itself and where it comes from and how it's been prepared, or teaching others about one's own culinary histories and traditions. As Anna, age 34, noted, I feel like there's kind of a nostalgia to it. I think back on the things that my dad made, and I'm getting to experience the nostalgia for myself, but then I can share it with my husband who didn't grow up with those things. Or when I make my son's birthday cake, it's just like my dad making my birthday cakes all while I was growing up. Grace, age 33, suggested that she's doing more cooking now than at any other time in her life and is especially interested in making Chinese dishes that are not easily accessible 
or dishes that her family would make back at home. As she explains, a lot of the times when I'm cooking for people, I'm cooking Chinese food. I think of this as sharing my memories of my family and my history and stories with others. I do this with my husband all the time. I sometimes make this noodle dish with tomatoes and egg. It's kind of a comfort dish, and I tell him, my mom used to make this for me when I was sick. Participants often spoke of using baking and cooking as a way of connecting with the past, honoring and remembering the dead, and of preserving family tradition. Lauren, age 30, spoke of her memories of growing up and camping with her dad, a tradition she has tried to continue with her own kids. We didn't really go camping that much before he passed away, and it's kind of daunting to think about going alone with the children, but they help out, and I'm teaching them the things that my dad used to teach me and recreating those things that I remember from him. So in this way, they can also have a little taste of it. Others underscored the importance of culinary traditions and doing what they can to pass those along to others. As Janine, age 45, explains, I do think about the legacy of cooking, and I want it to be passed on to my children. When I'm gone, I want them to remember how the touch of the cake is supposed to be when it's done. It's a way of extending me a little bit, maybe, beyond the grave. Still others express concern about keeping tradition alive when family recipes haven't been written down. As Gina noted, we've got some stubborn ladies in our family hanging on to their recipes till their graves. So the only way I'm going to get to know how to make them is if I'm there with them, watching and understanding some of those cultural traditions that come with cooking. She went on to acknowledge the performative aspects of cooking, underscoring the roles that observation, the body, and muscle memory play, saying, I think it's similar to oral storytelling. If you have a method and a means to create something and you don't pass that down, it dies with you. And you can write down a handful of flour, but if you haven't taught physically and visibly and with all the senses what that handful means, you haven't successfully passed down what is essentially an art form, a tradition that has involved skill, muscle memory, and not only all of the senses, but also an awareness of the senses of others. And there's no way we can get those decades of experience if we don't start early and often with the passing down of these types of traditions. As Gina goes on to note, keeping tradition alive can be especially difficult when the recipes have been made in various locations and by different generations of makers. By way of example, she talked about her grandmother's cheese cookies. If my grandmother were actually making them with real German ingredients, they would be very different. But she's had to do her own modifications while living in the state, so for her, they're nothing like the real thing. And so she's passing a recipe down that she's not necessarily proud of. It's not the same cookie she had when she was eight years old. Recalling fondly the Lithuanian food her maternal grandmother made while she was growing up, Paula, age 72, admitted that she's never been able to approximate its taste. I bought Lithuanian cookbooks and tried to recreate those wonderful dishes, but I just couldn't. When I asked Paula whether those recipes had ever been written down or passed along, she said no, explaining that her mother's manner of cooking was, by contrast, very American. My mom didn't do Lithuanian cooking. When you grow up, sometimes you want to change the way you do things, and so she never bothered to write down those recipes. When I asked Paula if she ever came close to approximating the flavor of her grandmother's food, she said, no, I tried. Whatever she did, it was her. It was just the way she created it. I end, as I began, on somewhat of a personal note, one about food, experience, and connection. I remember vividly the feeling I'd have each morning during the months I was conducting interviews, waking and feeling thankful that I'd be able to spend portions, if not most of my day, hunkering down and just listening as people shared with me their memories, histories, and experiences. As a novice cook and baker who didn't grow up in a home cooking kind of family, I not only learned about baking and cooking from participants, but was able to live vicariously through what they shared with me. 
but also in sharing with me their stories, memories, experiences, and sometimes even their recipes. Those very things have become woven into my own history, experience, and memories as a researcher of doing this research. Misha was my 94th interview, and I am struck now just as I was then, not just by her story, her memories, but by the way she was able to deal with a profound loss with incredible grace. Admitting that she'd always envied her mother's, grandmother's, and sister's culinary abilities, she credited all three with being the best cooks in the world, Misha had been mourning the loss of her mother's cooking and cooking knowledge. Misha's mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2017, and Misha recalled how, even before she was moved into assisted living, family members could begin tasting a difference in her mom's cooking. As Misha recounts, she was clearly beginning to forget what had been second nature to her for so long. She could no longer orchestrate large holiday meals. A lot of the things she made would either be over or under salted. Misha shared with me how, while growing up, her mom would always say to her, you need to be in the kitchen learning how to make this or that. She especially wanted me to learn how to can and preserve things because she would tell me this kind of cooking is going to be lost one day. And I would just always think, yeah, that's true, but I don't have the time or the patience to make pickles, and really, why would I ever want to do that? Why would I want to make pickles when I can buy them? There will always be someone else I can pay to make them. But now, she continued, what I wouldn't give to spend the day with her learning how to make homemade pickles or even her beloved pimento cheese. Sometimes, Misha continues, I'll be cooking or baking and I want to call my mom and ask her for help or advice, but I have to remember she doesn't even remember how to use a phone now. While Misha has been able to master what she refers to as the simpler stuff her mom used to make, the processes haven't yet become fully embodied. She still has to look back at notes. Admitting that the loss of her mother has really driven home for her the fact that she is no longer able to turn to her for the kind of advice her mom had wanted to be teaching her for all those years, Misha guesses that if her mom were still healthy, cooking would likely be their primary way of bonding, of communicating. She shared with me something she had recently been journaling about, the milestones associated with loss, with losing, and the profound sadness she experienced the first time she realized she was never going to taste her mom's chicken salad again. You know, she explained, whenever you experience any kind of death, there's always the milestones like, oh, this is our first Christmas. And there were all of these milestones like, oh, it's Easter and mom won't be here to make the strawberry cake, so I've got to try it. It reiterates how I lost her and what kind of effect she had on my life and what I miss about her. At the same time, Misha continued, when I'm making something that I know she made countless times, I'll think about her and it makes me feel like, well, I'm not communicating with her, but I'm communicating with her spirit. That sounds so new agey, but I feel like if she were here, she would be glad that I was cooking and remembering the things she taught me, like you always have to add a little bit of sugar to your green beans. And so I feel like she's there with me. As Misha continued, I used to think that making her recipes and remembering the things that she taught me would feel so empty. But I guess when it becomes the only thing you have, it becomes meaningful. She laughs for a beat before continuing. I used to think I would never want to make my own pickles or that I'd never really need to. Yeah, I'll miss you. But what was being able to cook like you going to do for me? But now, now I think it does more for me than I ever would have imagined. Because in the process of making something, I feel like I know something about what her life was like. When I'm making dinner for my partner every night, or when something does not go right, I know that she experienced that too. And that makes me feel connected to her. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs>